Welcome to the Tuesday discussion today with Emlyn Young from the Geography Department. It's wonderful to have Emlyn here today. My name is Christoph Marham, the director of the Rachel Carson Center, and together with my colleague, Dr. Gesa Lüdecke, the director of graduate programs, uh, we are convening the Tuesday discussions. We are always rotating, and uh, I'm very happy that it's my turn today uh, and to have a chance to talk with Emlyn Young. Um, Emlyn comes from, uh, I mean, maybe you want to even be seen in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> you, okay, you, um, I'll sit here. <laughs> you, he comes from uh, China, actually from central China, from a village in central China, okay. close to a place that we all know because of COVID, Wuhan. Wuhan, yes. Uh, but he was not affected by it because this was earlier oh, when, you, when you lived there. Yeah. Uh, and he actually studied, um, got his BA from a University of in, in the west of China, uh, then got his master at the Chinese Academy in, oh, in Beijing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because there were connections between his professor and a couple of professors in Hamburg, mm -hmm. um, he moved to Hamburg to the geography department, where they have a real focus, a research focus on climate and crisis and um, risk yes. um, and risk assessment and vulnerability. And he, he started to work on his PhD about climate and risk. However, having studied and having spent time in the mountains of Southwest China in a, in a really rural area, he realized that the focus on, on climate and risk is maybe not the only one that makes sense uh, because he realized when he lived in these mountains that people are coping with floods and like in ancient Egypt in a way where people knew that floods were not only negative but something that they really needed, uh, uh, dealing with the climate crisis was also somehow related to, to coping with floods and so he started to think differently, not, not about risk and vulnerability in climate, but about um, coping with climate, coping with floods. And uh, that's what he worked on. That's what he did his PhD on. At one point, he moved from Hamburg down to Munich because uh, one of the uh, people who has also been here in our Tuesday discussion, Matthias Garshagen, who is the chair here in geography in human Nature relations? Human geography, yeah. Uh, human, human environment relations. Human environment relations. Matthias uh, needed somebody who would coordinate a, a, a big project uh, about Vietnam, and he chose Emlyn, fortunately. And you are now an ERC grantee, right? Yes. So, um, working on a project that we'll hear much more about. Uh, the one thing I will tell you um, that I thought was really interesting when I asked Emlyn. And we met like for, at the 10th year anniversary for the first time at the Castle Center. When I, when I asked him, you know, what is it you really like in life? And he said, you know, I really like our mountains. Uh, and not the way most people here like them. Not like sitting on the top of the mountain and relaxing and taking photographs or viewing or, uh, or hiking and showing off what, how strong we are. I like the mountains because of the people there, because the people who live in the mountains, they have great stories and they are different and they don't appear in the news. And so um, I'm, I was very, I can't forget that. And I'm, I'm very happy, Emeline, that you are telling us today about climate yeah. and mountains in China. The floor is yours. So join me in, in welcoming Emeline Young. First of all, thanks very much, Christoph, for inviting me, for getting, uh, giving me this opportunity to talk in the Richard Carson Center. As I talked with you, I, I have been in this center for several times, but so mostly in uh, workshops, seminars, you know, we didn't usually talk personally uh, very closely in the past, but this is the first time really I'm going to tell uh, the research that I'm, uh, I'm doing in the next few years and also some uh, a little bit information about my past experiences in my study and uh, research. Um, yeah, you see um, on the screen there are two sentences here, two st statements basically. Um, I wrote them uh, to start the, the talk today. So first is climate warming we will reach the 1.5 Celsius degree goal by 2050. So, so I think basically everyone knows that uh, uh, IPCC 
and international uh, uh, climate scientists they set this goal um, of 1.5 degree and they are increasing more uh, studies now which stay uh, is staging that this goal will be reached even much earlier than 2050. There's already um, some papers, publications, reports say that in the next few years or even let's say by around 2030 there will be some years we already reach this 1.5 degree but not every year now so that's that's the current thing and the second statement is that human society will develop well in 2050 that's kind of my subjective statement uh, um, but I want to get your feeling that how do you think about these two statements do you think they are true or are you confident about that or how, how do you how do you feel? No? You don't have you don't have to have uh, exper expert knowledge about just how, how do you feel next this this statement as a normal people I would say you can ask this on the street ask anyone how do they think maybe just quickly do you as, as other same uh, uh, people I, agree with this or uh, for the first sentence I'm not sure I'm. A little bit intrigued by the second sentence mm -hmm. because I mean, what does it mean that we develop well is a is a kind of very particular expression. What do you mean by well? And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's the, what makes me think. Of course, it needs more clear definition and uh, to to uh, get more details, but it's very general here. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I can continue. I just continue this. Um, let's say. Basically, I strongly believe these two sentences. I think climate warming will continue at least by 2050 or even by 2100. And I also believe that our human society will develop well, continuously good, uh, better, you know, in 20 years uh, later or 30 years after 30 years, we will have a better life than today, just like what we have today than 30 years earlier. No? So that's what I want to say at the very beginning of this talk. But why? Then with these two statements, if you agree with these two statements, then you have some something in your mind. That's what I call climate resilience. Well, climate resilience is, a, well, you can say it's a new topic, but it's not very new have already many years and we have a, a good um, definition by Karl Volker. Climate resilience is basically a capacity, the capacity of a social ecological system to absorb stress, maintain function, adapt to disturbance and transform into more desirable configurations. Okay, that's very simple. Uh, let's say easy to understand definition, I think. It's a capacity and increasingly nowadays you see resilience everywhere, basically. It's, uh, it's really used a lot uh, uh, in public uh, uh, newspapers, articles, in scientific researches, in international reports as well. You see, I mentioned some IPCC, SDGs, scientific framework, the urban agenda, and even some more uh, relevant to my work is uh, about a root initiative in China and also EU-China summit two years ago. The very often mentioned resilience concept. Okay, but due to time limit, I will not talk about climate resilience, everything about it, but just focus on my ERC starting grant, which is called Stories, Spatial Temporal Dynamics of Flood Resilience. So this project focus on especially flood events. Now in this project, I have this research regions uh, to, to um, uh, generate alternative resilience solutions to flood impacts to uh, establish the emerging research field of resilience science and also to promote innovative resilience thinking other than uh, risk thinking. Um, but why I came to this topic? Why flood resilience? Né? I could tell you that during my uh, PhD period in Hamburg I did 
many studies on flood risk, climate change risk, flood vulnerability, risk management, damage, and also uh, responding measures, adaptation, um, uh, risk reduction, re reduction, loss reduction, and so on. That, that was my work during my PhD. Now it's quite, uh, let's say, traditional, yeah? If you can think about climate studies, risk, damage, adaptation, vulnerability, it's all about this, no? And um, then um, I, I did a postdoc period in Kiel as well. So in Kiel time, I focused on the past period. So I still do climate change, climate risk, climate adaptation, uh, uh, vulnerability, but just focusing on the historical period. So that's what I did in Kiel. There I published uh, um, uh, a book and uh, special issues. And especially this, this work is quite interesting. It's, it's quite a, a nice graph, but maybe difficult to understand. But I just simplify it to three sentences. So you see the temporal scales from days, uh, hours, days, weeks, months to years and to centuries. And here's this spatial scale. And a single measure is effective only in certain space and period. That means we human society deal with climate impact. We take different kinds of measures, many types of different measures, but a single measure only worked in a certain time scope and the space uh, uh, area. But measures have different effectiveness at the spatial temporal scales. Do we, uh, that means when you do something, you have an effect only on, in a certain area or at, for a certain time. But if you take all of the different types of measures together, you are able to, uh, uh, let's, let's say, reach a certain level status of being resilient. Yeah? So that's my, uh, the first, uh, not the first, but um, a major work of mine in the past years before the uh, ERC grant. And then I did <coughs> also quite a lot of household surveys in the mountain areas, but also uh, um, a tutorial project in Vietnam. Um, we did uh, surveys in the coastal area in uh, uh, the south part of um, uh, of uh, Vietnam in the Mekong Delta. There, I found that it's it's our our uh, not not I, I don't know how to say our knowledge of knowing that a vulnerable area may not be always true because we often say that ah the Karakurum uh, mountain areas in Pakistan how difficult the living environment is there how poor the people are, and also uh, uh, these people in Vietnam, uh, in the Mekong Delta, they suffer from flood every year, very often, how could they survive there? But when we only go there and talk with people, talk with people, and you find that they have a happy life, just like ours in the Europe, in, in Germany. They, you know, this, this is no much difficult than our life here. They are even more happier than what we are doing every day. Now that's that's interesting thing, make me think that scientifically we could estimate that, well, everywhere you can give a value, okay, how vulnerable you are in this country, how vulnerable you are in that area, but that's far from the reality, from the ground. Yeah? And I start to understand why it's so different. That, that, that's why I came out this resilient thing. I think, of course, climate environment change has impacts on our society in different areas uh, and the world, but people are able to deal with it at a certain level. Of course, not completely control them, but are able to make their effort and to still survive and develop in that kind of uh, environment stressful um, area. So then I came out with this uh, uh, idea of this uh, URC project. First, the state of the art. I wrote that currently many studies or, or uh, uh, reports, they focus very much on climate risk, exposure, vulnerability, damage, losses, 
You see, when, when, you, when you read papers, it's always like this, like climate crisis, risks, how serious it will be in the next years, and so on. But there are some ignorance of resilient or we call it successful flood management cases. It's not that every flood will cause people die or will uh, uh, damage buildings or damage a lot of things. No, it's not necessarily true. There are a lot of floods happening in many places in the world, but don't have uh, um, significant influences at all. And second is that we need some theoretical understanding of the internal drivers of a resilient system. Okay, now, uh, uh, in the past the studies, people say a system could be resilient, uh, high resilient, new, uh, lower resilient, <coughs> and so on. But we don't really understand how the system can be resilient. Now, how the internal factors are working there. And the third is the missing factor in the modeling tools. We need to assess resilience, we need to model resilience, we need new tools, new approaches, methodology, and so on. So the overall, the research um, the question of the project is that how did and also how does the human society develop and maintain resilience to floods? And the innovation points are basically pointed to the three uh, knowledge gaps. Right? Uh, to propose uh, this positive perspective, internal drivers of flood resilience, and new approach, combining agent-based model and the social network analysis. Um, I have case study areas. The first one is the T horse road area. Maybe not many people heard about this term T horse road area, but I can tell you simply that it's similar like the Silk Road. So Silk Road connects China, where Central Asia to West Asia, then to Europe. But this T House Road connects also China here. So here's Southwest China, and here's Myanmar. Myanmar, here's India, here's Tibet. So this T House Road connects Central China through uh, Tibet to India, or through Myanmar to India. It basically cross all the mountain areas. Here's our high mountains. No? Um, here is mountain area. There are a lot of ethnic minorities living there. They are not the Chinese uh, Han people uh, uh, there. Um, and interesting thing is that if you consider the past, uh, let's say, six, eight hundred years, they significantly mitigated their flood risk in that area from the past to now. And then I have a second research area, the Macon River Delta. Of course, we know it's a, a coastal uh, river delta, high population density there. And interestingly, they are still living with flood. Over thousands of years, flood happens every year, very often there. But they didn't mitigate the flood itself. But they changed the social system or adapt to the flood and they live with flood still year and year. No? So you see, that's, that's interesting thing. They are quite different, mountain areas, plain areas. They are diverse, but they are connected by the Mekong River. So here's the upstream of the Mekong River, here's the Mekong Delta. They have centuries of his, historical records that we can use to identify flood situation, flood response uh, measures in the past and compare with current time. So that's the interesting or unique study areas I choose. And then the research framework. I have four research uh, packages in the project. The first one is the theoretical exploration of flood resilience. What is flood resilience? What are the major components of flood resilience and what are the factors in it, you know, theoretical study. And then the second work package is the empirical case studies in the T horse road area, in the upstream of the river. And I take uh, two smaller uh, areas in the T horse road house area. First is the Ani River Basin and the Erhai Lake Basin. So just uh, do empirical case studies. The third one is to model this is the spatial temporal dynamics of resilience changes. Yeah? Uh, I use agent-based model and social network analysis. 
Then the first, uh, the fourth work package is trying to uh, transfer in some knowledge and uh, research results from the mountain areas to the uh, delta area in the Mekong River Delta and also try to generalize the research results to a larger uh, scale or to other areas on the uh, Earth. Yeah? So you see I have theory, um, case study, model and application. That's uh, basically a design of the research framework. Then methodology. That's also an interesting and uh, also quite uh, um, um, exciting part. Because <coughs> normally you can think how people do flood studies. When you read papers in, in the hydrological uh, scientists, uh, how they do flood in uh, flood damage or losses uh, assessment, how they do flood studies. It, well, okay, you have an, an, a feeling of how flood studies could be. No? But here in my work, I do flood resilience. First, use agent based model. Agent based model is able to model the interactions or relations between flood event and people. That means the flood starts or happens and uh, impact people, society, and then people start to, uh, to take measures, take actions to uh, protect themselves, reduce uh, damage. Nah? So agent-based model connects the flood and people. And then I use the social network analysis um, uh, for another part. Social network analysis is able to analyze the interactions between different groups of people. Nah? So in this way, I combine these two approaches together, I will be able to model flood and the human interactions in a networked system. So that is quite new, I have to say. Um, uh, so far, still quite new, I think. Um, uh, so in this way, we are able to analyze and also even model this impact response feedback in the system. And you could say the different people, different group of people, different organizations, institutes, departments, and so on, how they work together to uh, uh, jointly cope with a flood impact. Yeah? So that's the methodology. Then I have data connection and analysis. This, uh, um, as I said, I, I target to explore the flood resilience in the past time. So I will connect the historical data of the past 600 years, maybe even longer, um, use some unique event level data, reports by no codes, rep responses from the central imperial administration. You know, because of the area, there are ethnic minority regions they have some special connections with Chinese central government, the imperial government, uh, and so on. I, I can talk more ab details about that. Um, but they are basically available resources um, uh, which recorded the flood events in the past time. And also I do some recent studies um, on, on the flood events by household surveys. So as you saw that, I will do um, uh, case studies in the Tea House Road area, and I will do um, the household surveys of at least 800 uh, households in Erhai Lake and in River, and compare with the Mekong River Delta um, with households there as well. And of course, there are some second-hand data uh, which will be used to in, uh, uh, make more concrete analysis. To here, it's basically my project idea. You know what the project is now. And since uh, uh, Christoph asked me to, to be short, so we leave more time to discuss, so I will not give more details about, about the project, but just one more slide. Uh, okay, sorry, no, that's uh, not the last. It's just a nice graph to summarize everything together. Okay, I have theory study, I have positive perspective, uh, simulation methodology, I have this uh, uh, spatial temporal scales, agent-based model, resilience, 
and then uh, to reach some big gains in the end. Now, so that's uh, it's just a summary, uh, a nice graph um, to show um, the idea. Then the, this is the last uh, slide. But what is beyond this ERC project? Okay, this ERC project is nice, it's five years, uh, a, a lot of money and people, uh, students, but what's beyond? I have some rough ideas already. After this project, I will do still focus on resilience, the concept of resilience, but may extend it from flood events to more climate impacts, let's say heat, heat wave is a serious problem as well, sea level rise, tsunamis, nah? it could be many others. Um, but basically to, to solve or to, to give uh, some, generate some knowledge to fill the research gaps. Let's say positive progresses are not well evaluated yet, <coughs> positive potentials are not explored, we often hear uh, heard warning messages or negative warning messages to uh, to the future. So the po positive future is not promoted, and the scope from flood to climate, from social system to social ecosystem, or to understand the past to predict the future, and to use more uh, 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 technical or, or you know high tech uh, um, uh, approaches and data, and in the end. I could or, or, or already imagine the next 10 years or maybe 20 years I will dedicate to the resilience studies. I will try to create a resilience hub, uh, uh, develop resilience theory, generate resilience solutions, establish resilience science and to promote resilience thinking. That is my talk and uh, I'm open to um, discussions here. Thank you.